Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Good evening, Phil. Thank you so much for being here, and it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to the Open University here in Milton Keynes, where we're thrilled. I've got to tell you, as a newcomer to the Open University, this is a treat, and clearly it is for all of you, too. I can tell that we're, we're well attended this evening, and, and it really is... Um, it's, it's one in, in our latest in a series of the 40th anniversary lectures that we've been running, and, and I've been looking forward to this one for some time. Uh, as I already mentioned, a particular welcome to Philip Pullman, CBE, for being here this evening, the best-selling author and Open University honorary graduate. So um, will you just join me very early on giving a very warm round of applause to welcome back to the Open University. Yeah. So a little bit of background for you to set the stage, not that for most of you you'll, you'll need much, but I, I thought I'd share a few thoughts for you this evening. Philip was born in Norwich in 1946 and educated in England, Zimbabwe and Australia, which is an Australian I was very pleased to see, so that's terrific, before his family settled in North Wales. After reading English at Exeter College, Oxford, he began teaching children and writing school plays in 1970. Uh, Count Karlstein, uh, Philip's first children's book was a gothic melodrama, which was written as a play for school children and published in 1982. That was followed in 1986 by The Ruby in the Smoke, the first in a quartet of books featuring the young Victorian adventurer Sally Lockhart. He stopped teaching around the publication of this book and began writing Northern Lights, the first of a trilogy of fantasy novels entitled His Dark Materials. Northern Lights was published in 1995 and won the Carnegie Medal, one of the most prestigious British Children's Fiction Awards, and the Guardian Children's Fiction Award. It is also, incidentally, one of the set books in a newly launched Open University Children's Literature course, I'm very happy to say. The last of the trilogy, The Amber Spyglass, won the Whitbread Prize in 2002, the first time in the history of that prize that it was given to a children's book. In 2002, Philip won the Eleanor Fazun Award for Children's Literature, pledging to make fewer speeches and write more books. Public accolades do little to match the profound impact his books have had on adults struggling to understand the world of children and children understanding themselves. Now based in Oxford, Philip has maintained his passion for education, including, as he says, making foolish and ill-considered remarks alleging that not everything is well in our schools. His main concern, according to his website, is that an overemphasis on testing and league tables has led to a lack of time and freedom for a true, imaginative, and humane engagement with literature, something I share with him. Fostering positive attitudes to reading is crucial. Recurring international evidence from the Progress in International Reading Literacy Study suggests the reading scores of children in England are now dropping while still relatively high internationally, and their desire to read for pleasure continues to decline, comparing very unfavorably with other countries. Philip has a strong commitment to traditional British civil liberties and is noted for his criticism of growing state authority and government encroachment into everyday life. In February 2009, he has a keynote speaker at the Convention on Modern Liberty in London, which was attended by more than 1,500 people and wrote an extended piece in the Times condemning the Labour government for its, ta its attacks on basic civil rights. Later, he and other authors threatened to, st threatened to stop visiting schools in protest at new laws requiring them to be vetted to work with youngsters, though officials claimed that the laws had been misinterpreted. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me tremendous pleasure this evening to wel welcome Philip to the stage to give his lecture on the relationship between the story and its illustration. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction and for your welcome here this evening. And thank you to the um, computer experts who labored so mightily to get my bits of equipment matched up with what um, is going to put them onto the screen, I hope. Well, it seems to be working so far. Now, what I'm going to talk about this evening is this, this strange place, this borderland, this land along 
the frontier, um, which is the space that opens up between the, uh, the private mind of the reader and the book they're reading. And of course, this borderland is different for every individual. Because while parts of the borderland belong to the book, this is where we, we overlap with the book. You know, these are Venn diagrams we used to do in school. Um, parts of the borderland belongs to the book, but part of it is made up by and contributed to by and uh, belongs only to the particular reader, to us, to our own memories, memories of other books, memories of um, real places and real people we've known. The associations we have with this particular word or, or, or that particular style of illustration. Aspects that resonate with our own individual temperament. So whereas many readers might be reading the same book, um, no two of them will read it in exactly the same way. However, what we can do when we've been in this borderland, when we've shared this private time, this secret space, if you like, this borderland, we can come back from there and talk about it. We can tell others about our experiences of it and compare our part of the borderland, our experiences there, with other people's. And it's a, like all borderlands, it's a liminal thing. It's a matter of thresholds. It's a mysterious kind of space, really. And traversing this borderland is to find oneself between one state or condition of mind, uh, one existential plane, if you like, and another. To quote Wikipedia on the subject of liminal states. I always go to Wikipedia first, and I bet most of you do too. <laughs> it's, uh, this is quite a, good, quite a good article, this one. It's a state characterized by ambiguity, openness, and indeterminacy. One's sense of identity dissolves to some extent. It's a period of transition where normal limits to thought, self-understanding, and behavior are relaxed, a situation which can lead to new perspectives. Those who've, um, those of you, uh, who, who, who have read and might remember a passage from The Amber Spyglass in which Mary Malone is describing to Lyra the state of mind in which um, things occur to you. Uh, she quotes a passage from John Keats's letters in which he talks about this extraordinary thing he calls negative capability, the state of being in um, hesitation, doubt and mystery without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. This is a liminal state. It's a state between two, two other spaces. Now, yes, it works. Thank goodness for that. This painting by Gwen John depicts very well this fluidity, this dissolving, ambiguous state of being. Marvellously well. Gwen John had a perfect eye and a perfect hand. And she painted many pictures of women reading. It was almost her favourite subject. The expression on this reader's face is rapt and focused and calm. It's attentive to the book, but it's also perfectly, perfectly relaxed. The world around her seems to be dissolving, and we see it sort of dissolving into a, into a state of pale, ghost-like dreaminess. She might have been reading for five minutes or five hours. We can't tell. The world in which she temporarily lives is invisible to us because she's in that borderland. And all we can see of her is the small closed circuit between her eyes and the book in her hand. She's alone, but not alone. She's perfectly content. Like the man in this marvelous watercolor drawing by Honoré Daumier. Something perfectly self-contained about a scene like this. The reader, the book, and the setting. And we readers who look at it, we viewers who look at it with pleasure and recognition. There's a perfect harmony here. Activity and stillness, the interior of the borderland and the exterior of the sunshine and the orchard, relaxation and attentiveness. When we see someone reading like this, and we've all glimpsed someone reading like this, somewhere like this or somewhere different from this, but reading like this, we see a fellow lover of books, someone we don't know at all, and yet whom we, with whom we have such a lot in common. Someone whose pleasures and desires we share and understand and approve of. We too would be happy in that dappled shade, in that comfortable chair. And we understand too the ferocity of the reader in this painting by Baltus. One of his extraordinary studies of um, adolescent girlhood. Stalking the book almost, this girl, like a predator. The cat, which at the moment is sitting there so innocently, only seems innocent because it hasn't got a mouse to play with. 
The girl has her mouse. It's the book her hand is curled around, and she's not going to let it go, is she? Like many of Baltus's paintings, this is uh, full of ambiguities and mysteries and sexual subtexts, or not so subtexts, and mysterious and possibly sinister implications. Why is the other girl asleep with what looks like the head of a cello case resting phallically on her lap? And why is there a jug resting so perilously on the other end of the cello case? Can you see it there, shiny? As far as this young reader is concerned, though, the other girl might as well be dead, actually. If you're reading like this, no one else matters at all. The obsessive, merciless, solitary, amoral, almost savage devouring of a text to the obliteration of everything else is something we all, if we're honest, have experienced at some point. And when we, we get a bit older, we, we can't find books that do that for us so easily as we used to do. I'm sure we all remember being first gripped by a book that had us reading like this till our eyes ached and our, we were dizzy with it and we were... We were tired and we face was flushed. We couldn't get to sleep. We wanted to go on and on and on and on and on reading. Last in this little sequence of pictures, a print from communist China showing a happy gathering of workers and peasants learning to read. This too is a picture of what reading looks like from the outside. But it's a very different kind of reading. Nothing solitary here. Reading is a social imperative. It's your duty to the party. Once you can read, you'll be able to learn the correct line to take on every problem by studying the works of Mao Zedong, and the dictatorship of the proletariat will rise like the sun from the east. It's a collective thing, which is why we're not surprised to learn that private reading, solitary reading of the Daumier, Gwen, John, Baltus sort, is actively and forcefully discouraged under a regime of this sort. It would be antisocial. It would almost be an act of treason. It would be like turning your back on the collective will it would be betraying the party. Hence the power of such books as that wonderful novel Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress by Dai Sijie, which celebrate that very privacy, secrecy almost, that the first three painters were celebrating and the act of reading. Well, all these pictures, the ones we've seen, the private ones and the collective one, look at reading from the outside. They show what is left in this world when someone or some people are travelling in the borderland. They leave their bodies here, but their imaginative sympathy, their consciousness, their understanding, their, all those qualities of mind are partly elsewhere. We know what they're doing, those strange figures sitting still holding books, because we too are readers. We too have travelled in the borderland. But we don't see exactly what they're seeing, because their part of the borderland is different from ours. To see what it looks like from the inside, we have to think we have to look at a different sort of picture altogether. This painting by Caspar David Friedrich is almost the perfect image of that space I've called the borderland. The traveller is alone. What he surveys is being seen by no other eyes. He and he only has travelled to this mountaintop. And what opens out in front of him, now this great range of further mountains above the clouds, this mighty prospect extending as far as the infinite edges of the sky belongs only to him. It's an intensely romantic vision. And I acknowledge that. I'm perfectly happy to be romantic about my vision of reading and education and many other things besides. I think this is a good picture of reading because it depicts both the objective landscape that's visible to the traveller and his subjective reaction to it. One is an analogue of the other. The rocky crags half obscured by the mist below, they're the struggles and difficulties he's had to overcome to get here. Reading something worthwhile isn't always an easy process. It does involve concentration and persistence. The tree on the distant crag, which his uh, crooked elbow is pointing to, just below that mountain that's sticking up, you can see the single solitary tree on the, on the crag by itself. It's almost a mirror image of him. It's got its, it's, 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 its elbow sticking out like his almost, emphasizing his own identification with nature. The tree looks at him as he looks at the tree. He's not only observing this landscape, he's part of it and being observed by it in turn. When we read great books, great literature, we see people such as ourselves in a context that gives a perspective and a meaning to the situation that we're in. The even higher mountains in the distance are a moral exhortation. There is further to go. There are greater tasks ahead and greater visions to discover. This is the borderland. 
And the real point here, the reason I chose this picture, is that the figure in it, the image of the reader, as I call him, is solitary. We are each alone when we enter the borderland and go on to explore what lies in it and beyond it in the book we're engaged in. True, we can come back. We do come back. And we can talk about it. We do talk about it. And if we talk well and truthfully and interestingly enough, we might entice other readers into the book as well, and they too will explore it. But they too will be alone there until they come back in turn and tell us what they found there. And it may be that they'll find treasures beyond compare, marvels that we've overlooked, or the things that strike us as wonderful will seem to them commonplace and not worth discussing. This disjuncture between one reader's experience and another happens quite often with children and their parents. Children demanding to be read the same book night after night, long after any remaining nourishment has been wrung out of it, the exhausted parent thinks. Look, darling, here's a wonderful book called War and Peace. Shall we try that tonight? <laughs> no, no, I want Jolly Rabbit again. There is some magic in the borderland that keeps calling to us. I'm going to take a sudden swerve off at a right angle now and talk about some books that have been important to me or in whose borderlands I've loved to wander. And this is why pictures are important, because I can show you pictures and I can talk about pictures. I'm not alone in lamenting the change that came over children's books, children's publishing. I suppose about 30 years ago, when I was just getting going as a novelist, when it became suddenly unfashionable to illustrate children's novels. People of my age will remember the books we read as children, all of them illustrated, not just the picture books, but colourful picture books, beautifully and richly printed in, 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 on lavish paper, were becoming easier to publish about 30 years ago and, uh, and to print. There was a great flowering of wonderful picture books that began around then, but I'm thinking about black and white illustrations by people such as Anthony Maitland, uh, whose name is almost forgotten now, to, uh, uh, to our great shame, or Fritz Wegener, wonderful artist, or Robin Jakes, or Charles Keeping, or Victor Ambrose. I'm sure you remember some of those names, and I'm sure you'd recognise some of their pictures, even if you couldn't necessarily put a name to them. But they were no longer required to draw the pictures that we used to see in the work of such writers as Leon Garfield, Philippa Pierce, Rosemary Sutcliffe, and others. It's a great loss, I think. Anyway, the pictures I've loved in the books that I've loved are wonderful images for me of this borderland that I share with the book. And of course, pictures work differently from words. Specifically, um, in this case, they function like a window. We look through it. We can lean on the windowsill and uh, daydream. We can send our imagination out like a bird to fly over the landscape that someone else has generously imagined for us and make our own discoveries there. This is um, actually the cover of a book. Uh, I cropped it in such a way that the title and the author's name aren't there, but that's what it is. It's the cover of one of my favourites among Leon Garfield's novels, The Pleasure Garden. The illustration is by the great Fritz Wegener, whose work I've always wished would one day illustrate some words of mine, but I don't think that'll ever happen now. Every time I see Fritz, I say, come on, Fritz, we, we, we must do a book together. He says, oh, I'm very old. I don't think I can anymore. I don't think it... I, no, no, no. Anyway, I'll persuade him one day. But because I'm talking about the borderland, uh, I'm going to talk about my reaction to this picture, the things I enjoy about it, and be quite cheerfully subjective. So what I love here, as well as the marvellously romantic atmosphere, the, the lights in the trees, the lovers on the benches, the orchestra on the bandstand, what I all that, what I love is the great command of technique that Wegener has at the tip of his pen. I love the immense range of different kinds of small marks, small movement that the pen has made. Look at the way he represents the leaves, both on the trees nearby and the ones in the distance. Look at the row of little arbors in the background. Can you see them with the, uh, under little, where, where couples or, or larger groups are sitting around tables under little lights? And each table has a tablecloth. And look at the sort of crisscross trellis work. Can you see it there? Um, outside each of the arbours, which is quite different from the, the, the sort of cross-hatching we see in the shadows or, 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 or in the darkness of the sky. Look at the crockets and finials on the lovely mock Gothic bandstand, the sort of faux oriental archways over the arbours and the delightfully absurd crenellations and battlements above them. And look at the range of textures his pen can evoke, the, the muslin of the dresses, the velvet of the coats, the bark of the trees 
We know what they'd feel like to our hand. And the way the characters themselves are moving about or standing to talk or listening to the music, the young dandies showing off their fine calves especially. The, 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 the novel opens like this. This is the opening paragraph. Eastward in Clerkenwell lies the Mulberry Pleasure Garden. Six acres of leafy walks, colonnades, pavilions and arbours of box, briar and vine, walled in between Rag Street and New Prison Walk. When night falls, the garden opens its eyes. Lamps hang glimmering in the trees and scores of moths flap and totter in the shadowy green, imagining themselves star-drunk. Lucky illustrator to have prose like that to play with. Lucky novelist to have an illustrator whose talent was worthy of it. The next picture is by an artist with almost no talent at all. For drawing, that is. <laughs> Just shows how well you can draw without much talent. Do you recognize this? Ransom. Arthur Ransom, of course, Swallows and Amazons. Arthur Ransom was a wonderful writer whose stories from Swallows and Amazons onwards have an extraordinary consistency of quality. And that quality, it seems to me, would be markedly reduced if they'd been illustrated by someone who could draw. Someone like Fritz Wegner. Part of the charm of Ransom's books is this very amateurish, lumpish, clumsy drawing. They wouldn't be the same without it. The, um, the next picture is from The Picts and the Martyrs. And while he had no idea of how shoulders worked, for example, <laughs> or, or what a tree looks like at the point where it joins the ground, there is a great integrity about what he depicts and the way he depicts it. And clearly he loves the landscape he's drawing. These scratchy, laboured pictures have been part of my borderland for 50 years now, and I wouldn't change one scratch. This artist, on the other hand, couldn't make a clumsy line if she tried. Tove Janssen is utterly unique. There is none like her, none. And if you know the Moomin books, do try her adult novels, the summer book. An extraordinarily beautiful, subtle, wonderful story about nothing very much happening on a little island in the Baltic, in, in, the, in the Gulf of Finland, one summer with a grandmother and her little granddaughter. And they play and they talk and they fool around and they lose things and they find them again and then they go home. It's the most wonderful book. But this uh, the world that she created for the Moomins, the peculiar, charming, disconcerting world she created out of the Finnish landscape and especially seascape, is oddly both completely fantastical and realistically down to earth or, or, or down to water. The thousands of little islands in the Gulf of Finland are exactly as she depicts them. I don't know whether you have to be inoculated with her atmosphere, um, Muminismus, when you're young, as I was, I, I found her for myself on the shelves of the Battersea Public Library when I was nine years old. But once you once you've got it, it stays got. You have a free pass for life to the world of the Moomins. The next sequence of pictures comes from a French novel for young readers called, in English, it's called A Hundred Million Francs by Paul Bernard, which was published in the late 50s. These are actually the uh, the illustrations to the British edition, to the um, Penguin edition. Somebody, knowing of my enthusiasm for this book, sent me a copy recently of the French edition, which has quite different drawings. And if there'd been time, I would have asked the assiduous researchers at the Open University to get me the rights to show these pictures. But there wasn't time. Uh, you'd have seen how different they are. And actually, I much prefer these ones. Richard Kennedy, as I said, is the, I think is the, is the artist. I first came about this a little, a little after I, I fell in love with the Moomins. And as far as I was concerned, I'd never been to France, but it was about as French as anything could possibly be. I found his vision of a working class area of Paris, those crumbling walls, those shaky roofs, the torn posters, the cranes, the building sites, the railway sidings, the, the smoky skies, the air of semi-dereliction. Utterly thrilling and exotic. I gazed again and again at these pictures of a world that was different, but not all that unlike the world I knew, because the London I lived in then still bore the scars of wartime bombing, and there were patches of dereliction and improvisation, or corrugated iron and weed-choked mud and smoky sunset skies, not far from the streets I moved around in, but somehow this was all richer and 
sexier and much more interesting. And without being aware of why, I, why precisely I liked looking at his drawings, why they bore looking at again and again, I did love his, his line. Very different from Tove Janssen's, very different from Arthur Ransom's, but scratchy, scratchy like Arthur Ransom's, but, but, but different. Scratchy with swiftness and confidence. Look at the way he's quite cheerfully gone twice over the legs of the children uh, here, and, and why the dog has two sketchy tails and an air of battered canine chic. <laughs> Terribly French and intensely romantic. The girl he draws here, I'm sure, turned up 35 years later, called Lyra. This next illustration on scraper board this time um, is utterly different. Anybody recognize this? No, no. Yeah? BB, that's right, yeah, the little gray men. BB was the pseudonym of a writer and artist called Dennis Watkins Pitchford. Um, and through this book and others, I came to know and love that part of my outlying regions where the last gnomes in England live. BB was one of the great writers about nature in children's books. In Brendan Chase, for example, his descriptions of the woodland where the heroes spend a summer living wide are intensely lyrical, beautiful, extraordinary writing. In some ways, he was a limited writer. There are many things he can't do. But the honesty and passion with which he talks about wild things and wild places suffuses his best passages with a love of landscape, and especially English landscape, which is irresistible. And I was beginning to see, as I prepared this talk, something about my particular borderland, which might not be true of every reader. It probably isn't. One more example of the sort of thing I respond to very strongly is, well, you know who this is. This is, uh, this is Rupert. Uh, and it's one of Alfred Bestall's pages. Now, B Bestall didn't originate Rupert. He was created in the um, 1930s by a woman called Mary Tortell, who didn't do him for very long. Bestall soon took over, and quite soon he established a formula for the page of the Rupert Annual. That's where most of us read them, I guess. He was in the Daily Express, but if you didn't um, get the Daily Express, uh, you wouldn't have seen the Daily Rupert. Instead, uh, there was a Rupert Annual every Christmas. And... They were, they, every page was like this. And I don't know if it had occurred to you, but there are, there are not two ways or three ways. There are actually five ways of telling the story on this page, on every page. First of all, there are the pictures, which are it's central and they're important, right there in the middle. And they're colored, they're beautifully drawn, beautifully printed. So the, 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 the whole thing revolves around the pictures. And then there's a little verse under the, under the picture. And then at the bottom of the page, there's the prose. Um, I know a, a friend of mine, professor of English at a different university from this, who claims that she used to choose her friends by whether they read the verse first or the prose first <laughs> in the Rupert books. Uh, I can't remember which one was the approved one, but um, it carried a great significance for her. One interesting little detail is that both the prose and the verse are in the present tense. Now, that's important because pictures, of course, are always in the present tense. Pictures only have a present tense. You can't show what has happened in a picture. Uh, you show what's happening now. And the fact that the, the words defer to the pictures in this sense um, is another tribute to their centrality, the centrality of the pictures. So there are three ways, pictures, verse, and prose. But there are two other ways on every page. First of all, there's the headline, Rupert bows to the king, and that's different on every page as well. It says what happens. And then last of all, there are two little figures on either side of the headline. One of them is always Rupert, and the other is always an important figure from the story, the whistlefish, Rupert and the whistlefish. But as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm, what I'm going to talk about here is the, the landscape. That was what had me hooked. His landscapes were marvellous. At the end papers of every Rupert annual were, were a sort of fairy landscape with, with you know, wonderful Chinese um, pagodas and... Um, all sorts of interesting bits of forest and strange things happening. And here, we, in the bottom right-hand picture, those strange constructions in the bottom of the sea, what are they? Well, they're prison cells, actually. Each of them contains a prisoner. And Rupert's going to go and set someone free. Bestall was full of a fancy, 
I'm sure that's the word for the special quality of lightness and delicacy and charm that his landscapes uh, and his stories embody. He was a great, um, a great champion. But as I was thinking, as I say, about this borderland business and wondering which pictures to show you and talk about, I found that there were some children's books which, for all their great quality, for all the great quality of their illustrations, aren't interested in landscape at all. All the pictures we've seen so far are. I didn't like those pictures any less, or indeed love them any less. It's just that they were different. For example, this one. I love the caption here. <laughs> Richmond Crompton's William, whose literary life, in the course of which he, he grew not, not a day older, lasted even longer than Rupert's from the early 20s right up to sometime after the war. And he was drawn from the beginning by Thomas Henry. And it's this scruffy, muddy-kneed schoolboy who is our image of William still and always. And while Thomas Henry, like the author, Richmond Crompton, was very interested in human beings and delighted to represent the various comic types, both child and adult, who impinged on the life of, of William and the outlaws, and they're full of those. People, the, the village was always being, there was somebody taking it, you know, coming to live in the village or staying there for, it was an artist or, or a spy or someone you, interesting like that. And uh, William would want to, you know, go and be like them and interfere with them. But the backgrounds against which they're sketched and against which the stories are set are pretty rudimentarily sketched. We seldom have any sense of a real place full of its own atmosphere, its own intense and pungent personality, like Richard Kennedy's Paris or Arthur Ransom's Lakeland. Someone apparently um, once who had time on their hands and nothing better to do once tried to work out from the content of the William books where they were set. So they drew up complicated charts and worked out how long it would take Mr. Brown to get home and he went up to London every day on the train and what time he got home and looked at the train time tables and went through the number, number, kinds of different shops there were in the village and so on and worked out finally, eventually, in triumph that William lived in Bicester. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't know. It doesn't seem very likely to me, but it could be anywhere, really. I had the sense of somewhere sort of Surrey or Hampshire way, I don't know, or, 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 or Gerard's Cross or something like that. It's just generic middle-class England. Crompton just wasn't that interested in landscape, and nor are her stories, and neither was Thomas Henry, and it doesn't matter, but it's true. Another great favourite of mine, and very much part of my borderland, and equally not really interested in landscape, is... Uh, this. Does anybody know what this comes from? Um, one or two people might recognise the style of illustration. It's from Emil and the Detectives, that uh, wonderful novel by Erich Kästner, published in about, again, about 1930. Set, of course, very firmly in Berlin. But you wouldn't really know that from these wonderful drawings by Walter Trier. I've spoken about line before, about um, Kennedy's line and Wegner's line and Janssen's line. Well, Walter Trier's line is immediately recognisable as his and wonderfully fluid and expressive. But they could be standing anywhere, these boys. There's no background at all. And in the next picture, the room they're in is completely invisible. They could be in Arizona. They could be on the moon. But just look at those lines. Look at those parallel lines, especially. What economy. What versatility, what elegance and wit, how they all rhyme with one another. Here they, they represent the children's hair. There they're the curve around the side of the jug of chocolate. Somewhere else they're the struts in the back of the chairs. And down below they're the shadow under the table. Just quick lines, quick parallel lines to do all that. And every single figure is characterised differently. And he's got ten of them. Ten! All sitting around a single table. And a cake! Genius! That's what genius looks like. One more from Emil. Just look at these journalists, each one a complete individual. See how cleverly he's arranged them in the space, leading the eye from Emil back to the editor at his desk, cigar in hand. See how the room is suggested with the barest of means, the, the desk lamp, the suggestion of some kind of telephone, teleprinter or typewriter or something, it doesn't matter because suggestion is all we need here to evoke the busy and important life of a great modern newspaper, modern for 1930, of course. But for Walter Trier and his illustrations for Emil, 
Just as for Thomas Henry and his pictures for William, the landscape wasn't interesting for its own sake. It was a place for something to happen in. It might as well have been a stage set. The interest of these stories, it was then and still is, uh, not in the spaces they depict, the places, but in the people who move and act and talk in them. The little town of Bicester might as well have been um, Andover or Basingstoke. The big city of Berlin might as well have been Vienna or Amsterdam. The work of Arthur Ransom, on the other hand, is quite inconceivable without its very specific and particular setting in the Lake District, the lakes, the fells, those great silent hills that he loved so much, or else in the other part of the landscape, in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Norfolk Broads, East Anglia. And I wonder whether there's a, a genuine difference here between two kinds of writer, two kinds of illustrator, two kinds of children's book. For one kind, action and character are the important things, and the setting is more or less incidental. For the other kind, setting and landscape are absolutely integral to the kind of story they want to tell, to the only kind of story they can tell. I think C.S. Lewis was talking about something like this when he described two kinds of readers. The one who cared only for the action and the suspense and didn't care in the least whether the story was set in Camelot or on Mars or in Los Angeles. And the one like himself for whom such things as snowshoes and deep forests and Hiawatha sort of names were an essential part of the pleasure. I couldn't find the essay in which he said this, so I'd quote his exact words, but that was the gist of it, and I'm completely with him on the matter. And as for the difference between one sort of book and another, whether it's a, a deep difference or a superficial one, I couldn't say, nor could I say whether it matters very much. It matters to me because I'm interested in it, but that's all I can claim. And now I'm going to make another right-angled swerve and talk briefly about two more illustrators, one being the great Peter Bailey, who's done several books of mine, including some you might not have seen. Um, he's done my fairy tales, The Firework Maker's Daughter, I Was a Rat, Clockwork, and um, The Scarecrow and His Servant. But he's also done this. From the first chapter of Northern Lights in an edition that's just been published or published earlier this year by the Folio Society, which of course has resolutely gone on publishing uh, books with pictures in them when most commercial publishers, mainstream publishers, have long given up. When they proposed an edition of uh, His Dark Materials, I was delighted, not least because it would give me another chance to see my words illustrated by Peter Bailey. This was a different scale of thing altogether from my fairy tales. And all I can say is that I'm very happy with it. Here's Lyra in the opening scene, about to go into the retiring room. No, she's about to go into the wardrobe, isn't she? Because those robes are hanging up there. And there's Pantaliman in his moth shape. Warning her, don't do it, don't do it, don't go in there, it's dangerous. Come away, come away. And there she is a little later on, trying to make sense of the alethiometer for the first time. Can you see Pantaliman there as a, as a mouse, getting in the way and interfering as, as he usually does? What Peter does very well, I think, is get the sense of Lyra's character as well as the setting she's in. There he's got the scale of the bear and the um, apprehensive but undaunted figure of Lyra with a, a third form of pan in her arms. That's the opening chapter of um, The Subtle Knife. And I think he's got that exactly right, too, that little cafe under the awning and the two figures of Will and Lyra. This is one I particularly like. This is the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford where Lyra goes in the subtle knife. And there she's gazing raptly in at her the skulls in the, in the cabinet with their trepanned holes in them while she's being watched from above by the uh, sinister figure of the man on the balcony. And that's from the Amber Spyglass, of course, that's Mary Malone and the giant trees. And that's a scene from the, the World of the Dead. No colour in this, quite right too. All the figures of the ghosts moving across this great desolate bleak plain. The other illustrator I'm going to talk about is um, Moi. When the publisher before the first book was published, the publisher suggested that it would be a good idea to have a little, little, little decorative device, little symbol at the head of every chapter. And I said, what, the same one in every chapter? And he said, yes. 
And I said, well, why can't we have a different one every chapter? And he said, well, well, all right. And I said, well, can I do them? And he said, but you, you're not an artist. I said, well, I can draw. He said, well, prove it. So I went away and I, I did some drawings. And he said, well, all right. So, <laughs> so I, did them, I did them about that big, square. Because I knew they had to be printed very small. And they were printed very, very small. Uh, after some experimenting, I, I found a way of doing it that involved solid blacks and heavy blacks and solid whites, uh, which wouldn't get lost in the printing. Because um, not only were they going to be the size of a postage stamp, but the paper was cheap and, and coarse as well, and, and it wouldn't print very clearly. It wouldn't take fine lines. It's a mystery to me. It's a mystery to me why publishers in this country say they can't get nice paper to print my books on. My Greek publishers have no trouble at all, nor do the publishers in other countries. There must be lots of paper around that doesn't find its way to this country. I don't know why. <laughs> but this is the borderland, anyway, between the book and the writer, you could say. Here I am um, drawing certain things. This is the experimental station in the Arctic that Lyra finds her way to and rescues the children. Uh, it's, it's good drawing Arctic things because, of course, it's just black and white, really. That one I had to do over and over again until I got it right. The, the amount of detail is very hard to judge. And actually, most of, this, most of these fine, this cross hatching got lost uh, when it was printed. That was easy. When I, this, was the, um, this is the uh, scene from the first chapter of The Subtle Knife, which is set in a road along the northern edge of the Oxford Ring Road, Sutherland, Sunderland Avenue, it's called, which does have these very strange trees with houses behind them. I went out there to draw these trees to make sure I got the right sort of shape and somebody came out from one of their houses and said, so what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to draw these trees. And he said, well, why, why? So I tried to explain anyway. And I said, well, why, why, is, there, is there any problem? Do you, do you mind me doing this? He said, well, we have had a lot of burglars around here recently. <laughs> As if a burglar would go there in broad daylight and <laughs> case the joint, you know. Anyway, I got away with that. This one I'm proud of. It took me all day to do that little thing this big. And um, some of them, of course, are less representative than symbolic, you could say. I just wanted the idea of these prayer flags gusting in the harsh, cold winds of the mountaintops. And then comes this one, which is the last chapter, the opening picture for the last chapter in Northern Lights. I must have tried this hundreds of times until I got her face looking more or less right. She's looking up at the universe opening out above her and wondering at the extraordinary spectacle while being daunted by the thought of what she, she now has to do and being simultaneously absolutely determined to do it. I tried to get some of that into her expression and I'm quite pleased with it. But as far as um, we're concerned here, the most significant thing is what is not there because every one of the other pictures is in a box. It's got a frame around it and this one hasn't. It's the only one that doesn't have a frame because, of course, all the frames, all the borders have been broken open now. It's, it's the, the borderland is as big as the universe and she's, um, the whole universe is wide open. Nothing's shutting her in. When The Amber Spyglass was first published, um, the publishers wanted to get it out in a hurry because it took, I don't know, three years or something to do it. And writers were getting very impatient, saying, when's this book coming out? We're tired of waiting for this book. Hurry up, come on, hurry up. And um, there wasn't time for me to do the pictures because I'm not very practised at it. I love doing it, but it, each of them takes me about a day. And there wasn't an extra month or so for me to do the pictures. So we had to do instead... Instead, we had to do, um, make do with a quotation in a box. So I had fun looking up some quotations, and they did that instead. But when, when it was published again later on, I could do some pictures, which I greatly enjoyed. In fact, this, the one of the flags was from the Amber Spyglass. But for the last chapter of the Amber Spyglass, in which Will and Lyra have to part, what could I draw there? Well, I could draw the bench that they sit on, but that didn't seem right. I... I could have drawn something else or something, you know, I drawed this bit of the garden and the botanic garden and that, but nothing seemed to work. Finally, I decided to abandon the idea of simple representation um, because the heart of that chapter isn't about a place or a space, it's about a feeling, it's about a feeling of love and loss. So I thought I'd be sort of abstract about it and go for something entirely symbolic like that. It could have been more elegant, and if Fritz Wegener had done it, it certainly would have been more elegant, but there we are. Will and Lyra are bound together 
by their love, but they had to face away from each other forever. So I think a sort of emblem rather than a picture was the only way of doing this. And that's a sort of stepping stone on which we can stand while we leave the realm of the pictorial altogether and make a final right-angled swirl into something um, altogether different. Now, each person's borderland, as I began by saying, will be slightly different from everybody else's. And about a year ago, no, but two years ago now, I had a request from a chap called Tim Regan uh, of Microsoft Research in Cambridge, who asked if I'd mind if he played about with the text of his dark materials in order to see what, see if he could find ways of representing it graphically by computer. Not making pictures, but putting the words themselves to work in ways that wouldn't be possible without the computing power his organization was able to let him play with. And um, so, of course, I said yes, because I was intrigued by this. He's got a wonderful job, you know. All he does is, and in fact, several of these Microsoft fellows in this place in Cambridge, they have a terrific time. It's like, it's like being at a university without having to do any teaching. Or any, any you know, research assessment, none of that stuff. They just play, they just fool around with computers all day long. It's wonderful. So here is what some of the things that he did with um, my text. I can't show you the, the, the things in animation because I haven't got the software. But um, perhaps one day he'll pass it on to me. There you are. <laughs> That's the whole text of his dark materials printed in one long column. <laughs> Not all that easy to read. Uh, I agree. Perhaps, perhaps this is easier. That is in three columns. What's happening there is each of the three books, of course, is in, 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 in each of the columns. Now, the colours represent will respectively, blue, and Lyra in red. So you can quite clearly see that the first book is all about Lyra. Will comes into the second book. And there are patches in the second book and the third book where we don't see either of the children very much. Um, well, I could have told him that. <laughs> and so could anyone who read the book. But what's interesting is what happens when you look a bit closer. What he did was to... Uh, Printed out, and, and every time Lyra's, word, Lyra's name appears, there's it's, it a red dot, and it's joined, linked up, and so on. And the same thing with, with Will. And that's one stage on the way to this diagram, which, as I say, I wish I could show you animated, but I can't. This shows the occurrences. You have to, you have to, be, you have to be with me now, so focus, everyone. Concentrate hard. This shows the occurrences of words that occur after the word Lyra, okay, through all three books. Lyra's there in the middle of the, of the circle. And all those other petals around um, the, uh, the center are one of the words that follow the word Lyra. It's angular position from the center starting at 12 o'clock. Starting at 12 o'clock, they're the most frequent ones that follow Lyra and getting less and less frequent as they go around towards 11 o'clock. The diameter of the petal represents... I'm going to give you a test on this afterwards. <laughs> the diameter of each petal represents the number of chapters the word occurs in. So some of them occur in only one, you see, or very few. And finally, the distance from the centre... This is, this is, um, this is uh, PhD level now. The distance from the centre reflects the probability that when that word occurs, it does so immediately after Lyra. Sometimes those words also occur away from Lyra, but sometimes they only occur after Lyra. Now, the real fun is what I can't show you, what happens when you move your mouse over the thing. If you move your mouse over each of the petals, you get all that information. So he's done one for us here, which is, can you see on the right-hand side, it says obediently, uh, roughly at 3 o'clock. The number of times that word occurs after Lyra appears in a box at the top right, top left. There we are. It's it's two, um, near the middle there, two times, only twice. And this is the second example of it. And in the box at the top right, you see the sentence in which it occurs printed out. And it would do that for each of those petals. So you could go over, over the whole book and see what is the words that occur next to Lyra, all the way through with great ease. What he discovered from this particular example is that Lyra only does something obediently twice in the whole story. <laughs> 
And interestingly, each time it's when she's pretending to be good in order to deceive someone. Well, that's interesting. And that is something that it wouldn't be possible to find out really without this. Um, and so this is another, another, sort of, another sort of borderland, I suppose you could say. I think Tim Regan was hoping that this would be a useful tool for writers and readers and critics, maybe. Um, yeah, it probably would. Uh, if, you were, if you were looking at a text in this sort of way. I'm not sure it would help me a great deal because, as I explained to him and his team when they um, <coughs> showed it to us, which word I choose to write at any point is as much a matter of sound and rhythm and taste and texture as it is of meaning. Um, for one thing, I know the rhythm of the next, say, phrase or sentence before I know what it's going to say exactly. I know that if this sentence has gone to dum dum dum, the next sentence has got to go something like dum 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 de dum, or something like that. I, I hear the rhythm. So that, as much as anything else, governs the choice of word. Um, because all this, and so, and, and that wouldn't show this, this, all this, all this gigantic computing power and software. It's not concerned with meaning or, or anything else other than other than the, 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 the words themselves, which are a surface feature of the book, not a, not a deeper one. He could use the same program on a book in a completely unknown language, and it would come up with equally informative results. You wouldn't know what it meant, but it would show you those things. Besides, books are no doubt made of words, but I don't actually think stories are made of words. I think stories are made of something else, um, something quite different. But that's another lecture altogether. That's another part of the borderland. Pullman is going to take some questions now, and um, I feel sure that you're all um, seething with questions. Um, I do have a question myself, but I don't want to use up um, the time. So if anybody would like to ask a question before I ask one, please put your hand up now. Oh, you see, it's <coughs> still digesting. Um, then perhaps I will ask my question in that case. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, looking at all those pictures that's your, that are your favourites and noticing that they had one or two things in common, one of which um, is a very a large interest or a strong interest in line, mm. and um, wondering very much where you would put your own work in relation to um, the dichotomy that you described between uh, writers and illustrators who are interested in setting and landscape and the um, fantastical and um, writers who are pr more primarily interested in character and interrelationship? Well, I'm very interested in landscape. I, I, um, I think it's, it's essential for me when I'm writing a story. It's essential for me to know what the weather's like, for example, at any particular point. I have a, I have a little, little checklist, as it were, of things I'd like the reader to be aware of, or rather, things which I wouldn't want the reader to have to ask about. I'd like them to know where they are, in a particular scene, I mean, who's present, um, where the light's coming from, what the weather's like, if we're in a room, what sort of room is it. Um, these things are important to me, and so where it's important for the story, I like to try and make them clear so that the reader, if they're like me and needs to know these things, will know them. You have to know how to, where to draw the line, of course, not put too much in, because the danger is flooding the thing with information that is unnecessary. So it's a question of uh, judgment, and you learn that. It's a question of um, paring it down as much as you can without cutting too much away. It's a... It's a, it's a, it's a it's a thing perhaps you get better at with practice, I don't know. But I do like to know what settings my, uh, my scenes have. And I think my readers do. Well, I, if, if they don't, tough. <laughs> they put up with it. But if they do, um, there's enough there to give them a, a starting point. Um, I think there's a hand over there. 
Oh, I'll hand her here first. Yes, you, sir. Uh, I'm very interested in... Um, well, you know, my background is I write technical manuals and books. And one of the things I've discovered over the years is that the choice of the font and the font spacing is has a huge effect on how the information is actually understood. So you mm. could have the same passage, but in a different font and a different style, and the reader will take a different meaning from it. And you've been talking about how you extract information into this borderland. I was wondering if you had any comments on why this isn't extended more into the choice of font and the choice of the text layout itself. Very good point and a very interesting question. Um, it is, and in the books where I have a say in the look of things, I do take a strong interest in um, layout and leading and all that sort of thing. Um, you're quite right, it does have an extraordinary effect. I, when, I, when I came here this evening, I wasn't quite sh sure whether my Mac, because I've got a Mac computer with me, would work or not. And as it turned out, it didn't. And um, we had to put my memory stick onto another computer. So we got all the pictures right. But the, the, but the typeface I chose for the final that's all folks thing and the heading at the beginning isn't the one I chose. So I feel a little uneasy about that because <laughs> I'm with you completely in that these things matter tremendously. They matter a great deal more than we, th th than we think they do. Uh, and it's something to be interested in and conscious of. Something that um, computers have actually made it possible for us to be to, to take an active interest in, isn't it? Because before the the days when you could just call up the font and, which is really a typeface, of course, but um, call up the different fonts and, and 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 set it out in this one or that one, um, there was nothing we could do about it. We we had to be sort of passive consumers of this rather than active arrangers of it. Um, I do get a bit impatient with people who only use Times New Roman when there are so many more interesting ones available. <laughs> with, um, uh, yes. Um, I interpret the Times New Roman. There's, a, I think, there's a microphone coming. Yeah. There we are. I read a couple of years ago that you were um, working on another book about Lyra called The Book of Dust. Can I ask you what progress is being made, please? <laughs> 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 yes. Um, well. It's, it is making progress, uh, but slowly. I've been interrupted. I should, maybe I shouldn't have let myself be interrupted, but I, I, I'm, I'm nice. No, I find it very hard to say no when people ask me to do things. But I have been interrupted much more since the Amber Spyglass than ever in my life before that. But partly by the film, by the Golden Compass film that was made, it came out a couple of years ago. That took up an enormous amount of my time. And... Um, doing doing other things but at the back of my um mind always is the book of dust and it's growing slowly and when i've got through the thing i'm doing at the moment i will turn back to it with a great sigh of relief because i can now see my way through to the end so yes it is coming and i do apologize it's taken so long <laughs> lyra will be well into her mid-20s i think by the time <laughs> we get there Right at the back. Um, uh, you, you, I've seen in some books they have maps at the beginning. Have you ever thought that it might be better for it in your books to have like a map? Happening? Yeah, good, good question. Because I love maps in books. Do you? Uh, I think maps are one of the most exciting things you can possibly find in a book. When I did. My two little books, the Red Book and the Blue Book, as I call them, Lyra's Oxford and Once Upon a Time in the North. Do you know those books? Because they've got maps in them. The first one was originally just going to be a map. The publisher said it would be a nice idea to do a map of Oxford, a map of Lyra's Oxford. And maybe there could be a few little things to go with it. In the end, it turned out to be a whole book with a fold-out map in it and a story and all sorts of other things besides. So that was fun to do. That was a map of Lyra's Oxford, which you can use to walk around our Oxford, but be careful because I can't guarantee that you'll remain in our Oxford. And the other one, um, we wanted a map of the Arctic, the whole Arctic region. And for fun, we did it as a sort of board game. You can actually play this race game, a balloon race, towards the sort of circling around and going towards, towards the pole. So that was fun to do as a map as well. So I completely agree with you. I'm all for maps. Yeah, let's have map books with maps in them. Treasure Island. 
That started as a map. Have you read Treasure Island? What a treat you've got in store. <laughs> At the back there. Um, I must say, to, to return to the borderland, I've spent many happy hours in various different borderlands. But when you talk about illustrations, isn't there a danger that the illustration doesn't actually, that, that's in the book, that's somebody else's borderland. Mm. It doesn't match your borderland. And I have to say, the picture that you showed of William doesn't look like my picture of William. And your illustrator for the Folio Society got Lyra totally wrong, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you win some and you lose some. Um, you're quite right, of course, and it, it depends... <laughs> It does depend on temperament, as I think I began by saying. One of the things that affects whether we, we fall in love with a picture or not is whether we just respond to it in a, in a, at a sort of deep emotional level, below, which, b below the level we can talk about almost. Um, I found this with Richard Kennedy's illustrations to the, uh, the, the, the book that in French is called Le Cheval Sans Tête, but which in English is 100 million francs. I love his illustration. I can't stand the French ones. But the French were the original ones, and if I'd seen that first, well, I might not have liked the book so much. It's a mysterious thing. I can't understand your point about William, though. Surely that's the only William who could possibly be. <laughs> Thomas Henry's William. There's Martin Jarvis's William, of course, which oh, is... No, which no, we, which don't. You don't like him either? Oh, dear, you are hard, <laughs> hard to please, aren't you? There's just something about William that doesn't quite hit the mark in oh, that okay. illustration. I couldn't tell you what it was. I couldn't, I couldn't draw you a picture of my William, but there is something just not quite right about that William. Well, you'll just have to go through and tear all the pictures out. <laughs> <laughs> Another question down here. Moving on from the last question, when you were working with the Folio Society, did you give any instruction as to how you wanted those images to look, how you wanted each picture to look? And did you look at some of them and think, that's not quite how I imagined that scene when I was writing the novel? No, I didn't give any, any instructions at all beyond suggesting Peter Bailey. Um, I trust Peter through our long association. And I, I always think it's a mistake to suggest to an artist what scenes he or she would like to draw because their imagination just might, might not gel with that particular scene that, that, that tickled your fancy. They've got to find their own things to respond to in a book. So I've, I've never, in any of my work with him, suggested what he might draw. Only once or twice, I think, um, have I said to him that uh, maybe in this picture the scarecrow could, be a, could look a little more buoyant or in, 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 in that picture, you know, we could see a bit more of the background or something. But... Um, you have to you have to respect the artist's own um, autonomy. Otherwise, they really are just obeying instructions. And you you want someone who's got a a response and a living, you know, breathing uh, relationship with the work themselves. So I I didn't no, um, and I was delighted with all the, all the pictures that came up. Jolly expensive book though. Folio Society, worth it. <laughs> so, a question just here, about three rows below you. Hang on, the microphone's it's about to descend. <laughs> <laughs> I guess leading on from that point about, um, about illustration, I was wondering what you thought about book quality and build quality. And I'm terrible at judging books by their covers, for example. Um, and your red book and your blue book are and really nice hardbacks with, with nice illustrations. And I just wondered what you thought that influence had on, on people and whether that might be changing now with e-books and, and, and all that. Well, you're quite right, because we are on the cusp of a change as great, possibly, as the one that uh, Gutenberg and Caxton brought about. What with the coming of um, the internet and information online, it was my birthday the other day. My wife bought me an iPod Touch. And I'd never had one of these gadgets before. And instantly, I tried to fill it up with every app I could find. And in it, this little thing the size of a 
size of a playing card. It's got the whole of Shakespeare. It's got Dostoevsky, many novels of Dickens. It's just incredible. And you sit there and you sort of tilt it and it moves a bit on and then you tilt it back and it stops. It's just amazing. And um, uh, what difference it'll make, we know not yet. I don't think it'll ever be such a pleasure as, uh, to, to hold and to read as, as, it, as it is to hold and read a book. And the effect that the quality of the book production has on us is also large, as the gentleman said with his point about typefaces. It's very important. It has a subliminal effect on many people, no doubt, but the effect is there. If a book has been beautifully made, um, you treasure it more, you respect it more. I've just bought um, the most beautiful piece of book making I think I've ever seen in my life. It's the complete letters of Vincent van Gogh in a six-volume edition published by Thames and Hudson. Cost three hundred pounds, but my goodness me, every letter is there, beautifully translated, beautifully printed, and every time he makes a sketch, that's there on the page next to where he made it in the letter, and every time he refers to a painting that he's talking about or his scene or he's thinking about, there that is as well, where you need to see it. The footnotes are exactly where you want them. It's it's a beautiful and extraordinary piece of bookmaking that I'm sure will be treasured for hundreds of years to come because it's just a magnificent piece of craftsmanship. And I treasure this, and other people treasure it still, so the book will last for a while yet. Um, the difficulty is doing this at a cost that people can afford because, as I said, that cost £300. Uh, but it isn't a sort of book that you'd want to buy just for a quick uh, you know, read, or something to read on the train or something. It's a different sort of thing. But it's good, isn't it, to have different kinds of books we have for different purposes. We have our battered old paperbacks, and there's nothing I like more to see when I'm signing books than a child coming up with a battered old stained paperback that's been dropped in the bath and dried on the radiator and, you know, dog-eared and so on. I love that because the book has had a, you know, a long and hearty and healthy life, and that's the sort of thing I love to see. So um, they do have an effect, all these, these different kinds of books. And it's, it's, it's interesting to think about and interesting to talk about. Um, at the back, there. Hello. Um, I wonder how you answer some of the children's questions when you go into school. Uh, the reason I'm asking that is I sometimes look after a, a little boy aged eight next door, and I said, would you like to watch The Golden Compass? Yes. He became very pensive, and then he said, what will happen if Fudge runs away? And I said, who's Fudge? And he said, our cat. He's my demon. <laughs> and, and my answer was useless, to be honest. I just wondered, do you get that kind of question from youngsters in school? Well, I never had that particular one before. <laughs> but thanks for the warning. I'll think up, go away and think up a good answer. Um, no, children, uh, w w it was very interesting that, that how the questions d developed as the book was coming out in, you know, volume by volume. After the first volume and the second volume were published, a lot of children were very um, unsure about who was good and who was bad. Who should they cheer for? Who should they boo? Who should they feel worried about? That sort of thing. And I, I, I refused to tell them. I said, you'll have to wait until the whole book's finished, and then you make up your own mind. Because um, how do we judge people? How do we judge whether people are good or bad? Just because the author says they're good or bad? Or is it because what they do um, and the effect of what they do? And how do we judge that? Sometimes a person we think is good will do a thing we think is bad. Or someone, someone we mistrust will suddenly do something unexpectedly kind. It's difficult. So we have to take the whole thing into account. That's the sort of question I used to get and the sort of answer I used to give. But your fudge questions got me foxed, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, down here. Uh, where's the microphone? Sorry. <laughs> we'll take this one first and you in a moment. Yeah. Uh, I'm quite scared to watch the film. I don't want my borderlands to be ruined. Um, and... I, I was wondering how much of an influence you had over the atmosphere of the film, because the books are incredibly atmospheric. And um, 
yeah, I, I just don't want to have a different version of that uh, subjected to me. I want to keep yeah. my own precious atmosphere. How much of an, uh, 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 an influence did you have? Well, um, I had as much as I could as I could usefully have without taking up every minute of my life for two years. Um, as the writer of a book, you have a very limited amount of power. Uh, you can't say, don't do this, you've got to do that, or no account, do it, or whatever it is. You can't do that because you've sold them the rights, and they've got the right to make the story as they think fit. On the other hand, they want to keep on, on the right side of you so you won't go all grumpy and complain to the papers. So they take a bit of notice of you, but if you're if you're worried about um, it, don't see the film. That's that's the simplest answer. Actually, though, I think you're worrying unnecessarily for two reasons. In the first place, I think the film's pretty good, and the the the, the landscapes that they depict are are pretty good. In the second, and and the, and the second point is that you know, because of the question you asked. And we all know, because of our experience with books and films, that our usual reaction to films of books we like is disappointment. We expect to be disappointed. We know that she didn't look like that, and he wouldn't have said that, and they've left my favorite bit out, and they've changed the ending. We know all that. That's what happens. Um, so go expecting the worst, and you won't be too disappointed, <laughs> is, is, a, is, a, is a good general principle for going to see films of books that you've enjoyed. Um, the performances are very good. But again, your Lyra might not look like Dakota Blue Richards, who played her. My Mrs. Coulter did look very like um, Nicole Kidman. But it's because I told them 10 years before they cast the film that I wanted Nicole Kidman for that part. <laughs> and uh, eventually they, um, they came up trumps. So... Uh, so there were bits of it, bits of it you'll like, and bits of it will you be disappointed. But there is no law, thank goodness, that says that when a film is made of a book, all the copies of the book have to be taken away and burnt. <laughs> the book is still there. There was another question here. Yes. Um, I was interested in the contrast you seem to be drawing between reading as a private subjective activity and the sort of collective, potentially collective elements of reading. You seem to be drawing a, quite a stark dichotomy between the two. And yet surely enthusiasm about reading is partly about our ability to communicate that enthusiasm to engage with other people in doing it, as you yourself has, have eloquently demonstrated this evening. Uh, do you think the dichotomy is quite as great as you appeared to be suggesting it, it is? There are gradations, of course. And no doubt some of the um, people who were taught to read in, in the way that that picture implied would go on to enjoy their private reading and so on. Um, I was thinking, though, uh, not of uh, communist China in particular, but of an extraordinary book called Reading Lolita in Tehran by Azan Nafizi, who was a... Um, professor of literature in Tehran during under the Ayatollah, and whose account of trying to teach a humane literature course in a society that strongly disapproved of private subjective understandings of such things is very revealing, absolutely fascinating. There was a correct line to take on, on every, um, every subject. Even the students that she thought might approve of um, American literature because they were, they were left-wing and anti-clerical uh, anti uh, only liked the sort of literature she wanted to give to them because they showed what the, they showed what the enemy was like. That was, the, that was it. Literature had a, it was entirely functional, had no other, no other, re, no other purpose, no other meaning for that, that cast of mind, that totalitarian cast of mind. So that's the sort of thing I was thinking of. And I do recommend that book, Reading Lolita in Tehran, extraordinary book. Um, over here. Hi. Um, when I read your trilogy, um, some parts of it, I was more scared and disturbed than I've been by many adult books. Um, and I wondered if children find it scaring, and does it matter? No, they didn't worry at all. 
It's only grown-ups who are scared. Uh, yes, I, 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 of course they are to a certain extent, but um, I think they... they now, I don't want to speak for readers. I don't want to sort of tell you what readers, how readers are reading my books, because that's not really for me to say, except for the, the, the little I know about what they've, what they've told me about. And I think the reason children followed the book all the way through, not only the scary bits, but the difficult bits, um, is because they trusted Lyra. They liked Lyra. They wanted to be her friend, and they wanted to follow her through. And they, they, although there were bits they didn't understand, they knew that Lyra didn't understand what was going on either. And she was damn well going to find out. So they were going to follow her until she did find out. And they sort of knew, because we do sort of know, that the people we grow to like all the way through a book aren't actually going to kick the bucket. We sort of know they're still going to be there at the end. And if they wanted to, they could look at the last word of the book, which was Lyra like the first word of the book, which is also Lyra. So they could reassure themselves that she's still there on the last page, so that's all right. So maybe there were those things, those, uh, th those elements in it. Um, but I, I, I do think that the, the reader's own response to a book is something that can't and mustn't be dictated or controlled by the author. I'm very firm about this. I just read John Carey's very interesting biography of William Golding, and Golding had a, a, a firm line on what his books meant and how you're supposed to read them. He strongly disapproved of reading them in a, in a way that he didn't intend. Uh, I don't go along with that at all. When I'm writing a book, I am a dictator. I am a tyrant. I am a despot. I have absolute power of life and death over every character and every sentence and every punctuation mark. I am an absolute ruler, merciless. But when the book goes out of my hands and is published and goes into the hands of the readers, the whole relationship changes. It becomes democratic at that point. I have no further control. And the meaning of the book emerges in this borderland between the book and the reader entirely at the reader's own under the reader's own control, and I have nothing to do with it. I'm fascinated by what they tell me about it. But, of course, if a reader decides that my fairy tale, um, The Scarecrow and His Servant, is really an allegory of the Russian Revolution, and that um, this is what it's all about, if they want to persuade anyone else of this, what they have to do is all the old-fashioned literary critical stuff. They've got to look for evidence in the text, and they've got to find patterns of imagery and, and language and so on that would reinforce this idea. And then they've got to look for any supporting evidence they can find somewhere else. And if they manage to persuade anyone else of this, uh, good for them. But I'm not going to tell them they're right or wrong. Um, that's, that's for the readers themselves. It's, 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 it, it begins as, a, as a, 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 a totalitarian process and ends as a democratic one, this writing, reading business. Just take one last question. I'm conscious that um, Mr. Fullman's going to um, be available for a book signing afterwards, and I'm sure many of you will want to. Should we just take this one in the middle here? Hello. It's a follow-on, really, from that one question we just had. How important do you think it is for children to understand what they're reading or what's being read to them? Um, the reason I ask, I'm, we've moved on with my five-year-old from picture books to more chapter novels. Um, we've been working through some of the younger Roald Dahl books um, and we've done the first Harry Potter book. Um, I've just brought the Scarecrow book for him, your book. Obviously he's not going to pick up on the Russian Revolution at five. Um, <laughs> but and I, I mean we started reading Matilda for example and I wasn't sure that he was comprehending the language that was going on in the book. And I just wondered how important you think it is for children to understand it or whether they should just be exposed to all levels. Well, I'm glad you're doing this with your, with your child, but I hope you're not leaving picture books behind, by the way. No, 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 because we've got a two-year-old and he raids her bookshelf. Oh, good, good, well, but yeah. because <laughs> picture books are good for a very long time yet. Um, no, I don't think it's important that a child should understand every word. In fact, I think it's quite important that there should be some words in a book that they don't understand. But I think it's, it's very good if you're reading it with them, because if they, if they want to stop and ask, they'll ask and you can tell them. 
Uh, if, if, but the chances are, if the story's an exciting one, and most of Roald Dahl is pretty exciting, they won't mind. They'll, they'll go along with it. They'll put up with not understanding a bit because they'll, it, it'll come clear later on. Mm. And that's the way we learn, after all. That's the way we learn how to live, by not understanding things and then putting up with, with a bit of doubt and mystery until they sort themselves out. The best lesson you could give a child, actually, is to do, give them a book they can't entirely understand. Yeah. So good, good for you. Carry on. But don't leave the picture books behind. No. Oh, no, no. no. We, we're, we're waiting for a book from the library at the moment, so we've gone back to Mr. Men books. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank on your behalf, um, Mr. Pullman, for a really fascinating talk. I'm sure you'll agree with me that it was wonderfully wide-ranging and has left us with a great deal to think about. Um, he is going to be uh, on the first floor signing books, and there is tea and coffee um, on the floor below for those of you who need further refreshment. Um, and meanwhile, perhaps you'd like to join me in thanking Mr. Pullman um, for this. Thank you. Thank you.